video I wanted to record today is a just a short little one about um, the things that I wish I knew when I started running, things that I would have helped me, you know, avoid some pain, some discomfort, um, especially at the beginning. So hopefully this helps you out along the way as well, especially if you're just getting into running. I've kind of tried to break it down into 10 things, but I'm expecting I'm gonna ramble a little bit, so I will try not to, but we'll see what happens. Um, okay, so first thing uh, is understanding that I wish I knew was kind of how my body changed and what the time scale for that would be. Because what I do see a lot of, especially with clients, is the desire to run all of the time, thinking that that's gonna to lead to faster progress. And unfortunately, um, our bodies need rest and recovery in order to actually adapt to the training that we're putting them through. For instance, you know, your blood volume is gonna go up within two weeks of you starting running. So let's say you've never run before and you're starting a brand new running program. Within two weeks, you're going to find that you're catching your breath a little bit easier and that things aren't as hard as they were before when you're out on the trails. But your muscles are going to take longer than that to adapt. And even more so, your connective tissue, your ligaments and your tendons, they're going to take a matter of months to adapt to the changes, the, the new training stress that you're putting it through. So, you got to remember that even though a 5k is feeling easier, our body might not be ready just yet to bump up the volume or to run a 5k every day for a week. And that leads me into the second thing. Now, I've never been a run streaker. Um, and if you're new to running, you might not know what that is either. It's not as bad as it sounds. Um, a run streaker is someone who decides they're gonna run for X number of days in a row. So maybe it's a month, maybe it's a year. Um, I've seen people keep them going for a very, very long time, which is really cool. The only drawback to our running streak is again, takes our muscles and ligaments much longer to adapt than our energy systems. So we have a higher chance of overdoing it if we're deciding that we have to hit the pavement every single day. I'm getting ready for some races in the fall, hopefully, right now. I mean, I'm only running four days a week max. So that rest and recovery, that cross training, which I'll get to in a second, is super important. So if you wanna run streak, if you wanna do X number of days in a row, my advice to people who wanna do that is do, don't run in one day like don't run, let's say you're gonna do a 30 day streak. When you set the distance that you're gonna do each day, let it make it less than a 10th of what you could comfortably race right now. So that um, for you, let's say that you can run a 5K really easily I would suggest that 500 meters would be the maximum that you decide to do every day if you're gonna do some sort of run streak. And what that's gonna do is make that total amount uh, over the course of the month a lot easier. And then the other thing I'd recommend is if you're gonna do a streak, talk to a coach first so that they can help you plan for that. But streaking can be, <laughs> Streaking can be dangerous when it comes to running and all other types of streaking can have negative outcomes as well. Um, the third thing that I was kind of alluding to is cross training specifically um, with exercises that are fit for your body and how you run is gonna be really important. So don't just be an endurance athlete who doesn't do any strength. There is amazing gains to be found in your running if you incorporate strength training. And I could go on about that for hours, but I won't because I'm trying not to ramble on this video. And I've already been going for seven minutes. So I'm only three points in. The next one is 
Uh, oh yes. The next one is getting sucked into gear before you need it. Uh, you only need a couple things to run and that's kind of, that's one thing I really love about running is that at the end of the day, a pair of running shoes, shorts, not even fancy shorts, a shirt, not even a fancy shirt, um, is good enough. You don't need more than that. But you'll see lots of folks that have, you know, the watches and uh, hydration packs and special recovery aids. And my thought on that is keep it simple so you can change one thing at a time. I didn't get a running vest until after I did my first trail 50K. Um, I was using just a regular backpack and it worked fine. There's a little bit of chafing. There's a lot of chafing, but it worked fine other than that. And um, if you're going to get gear, the only thing I would say you should invest in is a really affordable heart rate monitor and watch. And that watch does not have to track everything in the world. It's cool when you can see your route on your unit after the fact, but um, it's not necessary. And if you use heart rate as training, which I'll get to, because that's a really important part of um, making progress in your running. If you just have the capability to read, have a heart rate chest strap and a watch, that is probably the most important gear that you'll have. But you don't need all the gear, especially at first. Start easy. The next thing that that kind of leads into is I often find that people will get sucked into buying a lot of gear if they feel like, oh, I'm not a runner until I buy this brand new watch or I run 18K at once, or I can do a 20 minute 5K. A lot of people set standards for what it is they have to do before they're actually a runner. And my big thing there is if you've run, I think every human is a runner in one way or another. You don't have to do a certain distance. You don't have to do certain trails in order to actually be considered a runner. So you're a runner the moment you put on running shoes, not even. You're a runner the minute that you start running. Um, so don't think that you have to reach a certain milestone before you can call yourself that. The next thing that is kind of good advice for when you're starting out um, is to try not to use pace as an indicator of intensity. And so what I mean is a lot of times I've seen people go out and their kind of training plan is they're going to run a 3K every day the same route and they're going to see how fast they can do it and when they start running it faster they know that they're getting better and having goals is good trying to run certain routes faster is good but um, slow runs low intensity runs are really important for helping change your physiology and that is going to make you a better runner in the long run so use heart rate instead of pace as an indicator of your intensity. And if you don't have a heart rate monitor yet, I have a video on how to estimate what zone you're in based on rate of perceived exertion. So based on how hard your run is feeling right now. So, uh, but just remember how you feel and or what your heart says, which is kind of the gold standard for intensity, is going to be a better indicator of pace. Case in point, today my run went, I wonder if you can see it, it went up that mountain right there. So my, I think my slowest kilometer was like a 20 minute kilometer. So that was what my pace was. Um, and my fastest was like a four or something minute kilometer. So if we just went off of, oh, I'm trying to go as fast as I can all the time, then I would say that those 20 minute kilometers were junk and they weren't junk. They were high elevation kilometers. Um, there was, you know, navigating the trail and stuff like that. And so using, by using pace, that would just totally be different um, because some of those 20 minute kilometers were a higher intensity than some of the faster kilometers. So just remember, pace does not equal intensity. It depends the train you're on. And um, second to that, doing slow work at a low intensity is going to help you big time because it's going to change what's happening on the inside. It's going to work on different aspects of your physiology than 
going as fast and as hard as you can right off the bat. That's an important one. I could go on, I could go on for all of these for like hours, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to. Um, next one, oh, this is important. Having a warm up and a cool down. And this is hard because, especially if you're meeting a friend to run with, which I think is a fun thing to do, um, you often don't want to be the weirdo doing warm up, uh, but warm up has massive benefits when you actually get started and get out running because your muscles and ligaments and your heart and lungs are ready for what you're about to do, you're going to get more out of that run once you actually start running. Now, sneaky thing that I do is if I'm meeting people to go for a trail run or just a regular run around town, I will do my warm-up moves at home and then I'll drive and meet them. And that's nice because once you get your heart rate up and once you introduce some movement to your joints, those benefits are going to stay with you for at least an hour. So as long as you're not driving more than an hour to your trailhead, you're good to go. Um, so do your warm up and then don't forget about your cool down. This one's hard. I'm bad at this sometimes because you were working really hard to do your run. And sometimes at the end of it, you just want to sit down, have a chocolate mocha coffee situation a beer if it's hot out I'm saying coffee because it was a wet and rainy one out there today um, but sometimes you just want to you know get on to refueling and get on to the rest of your day but if you take a few minutes to even just scan your body pick one area that you're going to do a little recovery on that is going to help you massively massively on your next time out so make time for warm-up make time for recovery afterwards um, that leads into the next thing you don't need Gatorade if you're not out there for more than an hour and a half now there's some caveats for this uh, if it's really hot out or you're pushing at the top end of your intensity then you might need some fuel along the way and Gatorade can serve as a fuel but you um, I often see the overconsumption of these high sugar drinks um, when you don't need them during shorter runs. So just it just comes to being mindful, right, about, oh, what does my body actually need for this run or race or whatever it is? And then make sure that you're um, consciously refueling. Same thing with water. We can overconsume water. I don't know if you've ever done that out on a run and then it feels like your stomach is just full and that's not a very comfortable feeling. So if you're out there for more than an hour, hour and a half, water is important. Um, this is different if we're on trails and I'm going to record a different video for trail running for sure. But um, yeah, make sure that you're not over consuming water or Gatorade in particular when you're out for your runs if they're shorter. Okay, next one. I'm going to try not to ramble for these next few. Um, we talked about mobility and strength. We talked about cool downs, warm ups. Talked about not being a runner, using pace as an intensity indicator. Um, we talked about doing too much too fast and how running streaks can be tough and that we have to be really careful with how we employ them. Um, oh, this is an important one. This is, I think this is the last one too. I'm glad it ended up being last. Um, running is a skill pacing yourself in particular is a skill so you're gonna get better at it just by going out there and doing it which is really neat um, but you can consciously work on your pacing and you can review your runs look at how they went and then try to use a different plan the next time so for instance uh, some athletes will start really slow always in races and they get this big kick at the end, which is awesome. They're pulling negative splits is what we call it in running. And that's really great, but they might be leaving a little bit of pace, a little bit of speed on the table. On the flip side, I've seen a lot of athletes that will always go out too hard on their runs. And I know that someone is doing this if they say to me things like, you know, oh, I just, at 20 minutes, I just can't go anymore. Like I could never run more than 20 minutes. And if you consciously do some skill building runs 
um, that help you work on pacing, help you work on using your heart rate and that perceived rate of exertion to um, test your body, experiment, push, see where you're at, you will find that it helps your running and your racing like crazy. Um, what I am going to do is I will, in the description, um, put a couple example pace skill building runs that you can try and use. And I've found that with beginner runners, they make a massive difference in accelerating progress um, because running is mental as well as physical. And so knowing how to push yourself is important. And the other side of it is it is a sport at the end of the day and sports have skills. Um, and pacing is definitely one of those skills. So I'd love to know if there's something that I missed, um, something that you wanna know more about, or a mistake that you made when you were a beginner runner that you would love to save other people from doing as well. Um, that's it for me. I am gonna head into town for tacos now. <laughs> so um, I will see you guys out on the trails soon. Thanks for tuning in.